main speaker tonight today, Jean Garrigus, uh, who's going to be talking, who will be introducing his fabulous new book, A Secret Among the Blacks, uh, Slave Resistance Before the Haitian Revolution. We have quite a big panel, so I will have my introductions as a, a, a very, 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 very short um, and, and let everybody talk. Uh, before I begin, however, I just wanted to say that we had um, a very sad news from the Wilberforce Institute, which is to announce the, the death yesterday of our founding director, David Richardson. Uh, this is a very sad day for us. He, he was uh, uh, an inspiration uh, to many people. Uh, you'll find a, a fuller description of him on our website. Um, the, the leading scholar in slavery and, of course, a huge institution builder in terms of building the World Wars Institute. Uh, so without further ado, and with apologies again for not being able to, to see me, uh, I, can, I, can I pass over to uh, the author of The Secret Among Blacks, uh, Slave Resistance Before the Haitian Revolution, uh, and Mrs. John Garrigus. John Garrigus is a professor of history at the University of Texas at Arlington, uh, the author of many books on Haitian history, uh, and, uh, and with me has authored A Plantation Machine uh, Atlantic capitalism in the French Atlantic uh, and, the, and and British Jamaica. Uh, so over to you, Gareth. Uh, to you, to, over to you, John. And just to, just to just to to, to, to make clear, uh, this book is not yet published, but will be published in September uh, by Harvard University Press. And we certainly urge you uh, to get a copy of this, John. Thank you, Trevor, for the introduction, and thank you and the University of Hull and the Wilberforce Institute, uh, your colleagues Judith Spixley and Amy Richardson for organizing this uh, event. I'm really, uh, really grateful and uh, feel very, very honored. Um, I, I want to give a special thanks to Amy Richardson, who's going to help me advance through a, what's a fairly ambitious slide deck. But, um, and I'm also got, want to thank all the panelists for agreeing to be part of this seminar. I'm, I'm very honored by their participation and I'm eager to hear their comments. So uh, uh, I'm also conscious that many of the people uh, watching this most, of, of course, will not have read the book. So I thought the best use of my 10 minutes would be to give you a, not so much an overview of the book, which is really about a narrative of stories, the lives of people, the resistance uh, uh, situations and communities that uh, they were part of, but instead a kind of an x-ray of the book, that is the conclusions that I draw out of those stories. And I want to move through that kind of uh, x-ray uh, in reverse chronological order, starting with the August 1791 uprising, uh, and then describing the diverse resistance communities that, as I say, stream together to cause the, uh, to cause the, the uprising. And then I want to focus on the specific constellation of dangers that shape the lives of people in the North Province uh, above and beyond the already horrendous conditions of sugar and coffee slavery in the Caribbean. Next. So it's not particularly uh, you know, original to say to hypothesize that the revolutionaries of 1791 mobilized pre-existing communities. Uh, next. But I think if we take a look uh, closely at the first two days of the revolution, we can see how there was much more than just a week or two of organizing the kind of meetings that David Gagas and others have laid out so carefully and, and beautifully at Morne Rouge and, uh, and, and Bois Caimon. So let's zoom in on the area here behind the modern day city of, of Cape Haitian, the North Province of Saint-Domingue. Next. And let's look at this 18th century manuscript map that shows uh, there in, re in red, this colonial city of Cap Francais in, uh, in sort of tan colors, the uh, sugar, great sugar uh, plain of the North Province, and then in relief to the south and west of the plain, the coffee mountains uh, that were also an important part of the story. Next. So for years, I've been telling my students that the Haitian Revolution started in this great sugar plain. And I found in the course of this book and looking carefully at the chronology that Carol and Fick and others have established, that in fact, the revolution began, began at the intersection of the sugar plain and the coffee hills. Uh, next, as, as Fick uh, shows, the revolution began simultaneously on the night of August 22nd to 23rd 
uh, in the Akol Parish, uh, where Buchman of the Duty Plantation uh, raised people on the neighboring Noe estate. And at the same time, a lesser known group also uh, rose in revolt in the, uh, in the um, Lembe, upper Lembe Valley and proceeded down that uh, river channel to uh, rendezvous with, uh, with Buchmann under the leadership of Paul Bellin at the coast. Next. After that rendezvous next, uh, the revolutionaries turned Buchmann to the east out in, into the sugar plain to Galafet eventually, and Bellin and his successors moved south into the coffee parishes of Lembe and Plaisance, et cetera. So two, three, 4,000 people were mobilized in just merely two days. And uh, that suggests to me uh, that there was a uh, pre-existing network of, com of communities in place. And I have to say, that's my conclusion after discovering these communities and realizing that, uh, that they were there and then realizing that those communities were in the very place uh, where the revolution broke out. Next. So uh, let's take a look at those communities that uh, emerged through the book. And the book is very much, as I said, a collection of stories of individual uh, enslaved people and their actions. But uh, so it's not a, a really a kind of a typological sort of study. But I do think it's possible to pull out four types of resistance communities that emerged through, through these stories in spite of the attempts of colonists to repress the 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 to repress uh, the evidence of this kind of resistance next so i discovered uh a, a groups of people who were using african inspired medicines to soften the hearts and probably the minds of their enslavers in various parts of the north province next i discovered uh people using african inspired divining techniques and spiritual uh, ideologies to create communities to get protection against the particularly horrendous events that I'm going to talk about in a, in, in a few minutes next. I also discovered people using French legal culture fruitlessly, as you might imagine, but using the provisions of the Code Noir and the 1780s uh, slave management laws to get try to get some protection against the horrific actions of their enslavers. Next. And then as Jean-Louis Donadieu and David Gagas and others have suggested, I found a pattern of labor strikes on at least seven sugar plantations in the 1780s. And I wanna talk about those a little bit more because those arose directly out of the conditions I'm gonna uh, be describing in a few minutes next. So if we look at the combination of all these different uh, resist types of resistance, we can see that even though there was no single ideology, of resistance, there was a pattern of people throughout the sugar plain and the coffee regions that um, uh, corresponds uh, closely to the early moments of the revolution. Next. Now let's talk in an even uh, more close detail about the specific dangers that existed in, in the North Province and the sugar and coffee areas. And I'm talking here about the ways of death that we associate with it. Um, the affair known uh, inaccurately as the Mackandal conspiracy. Next, as many of you uh, many of you will know, in 1758, a man who had escaped slavery, uh, who went by the name of Mackandal, was burned alive by French colonists and uh, convicted uh, unjustly and really without any proof, as I show in chapter four of the book, of organizing a vast conspiracy to kill the colonists uh, by using African poisons. Um, I describe the origins <clears throat> of that idea of a conspiracy and then the real actions of, of, of Mackandal, but um, uh, it's uh, nevertheless that uh, idea of a vast poison conspiracy has existed throughout the historiography and certainly in the minds of colonists and enslaved people for the next uh, 30 and 40 years. Next. However, the colonial ministry was deeply skeptical about this. And so in the 1760s, after the end of the Seven Years War, they uh, discouraged uh, uh, public trials of poison uh, of, of, of slave, enslaved poisoners. And so colonial judges turned a blind eye to uh, enslavers, colonists who, main, who conducted their own private inquisitions, 
um, interrogating, torturing, and in many cases, uh, executing their, the people that they had enslaved uh, and people that they believed were guilty of killing other enslaved people and uh, livestock herds through the use of African poison. So those trials, um, are, uh, are in the record in the 1760s and 1770s and on into the 1780s. Next. So on the one hand, we have waves of mysterious death. And on the other hand, we have enslaved people who themselves are the primary victims of those deaths being persecuted by planters in an uh, extraordinarily vicious uh, fashion. Yeah, while this was happening, French medical practitioners were increasingly able to identify the symptoms of, an, uh, of uh, one of a number of livestock uh, diseases that was epidemic in France and had been transmitted uh, to, uh, to Saint-Domingue probably in the 1740s. Talking about the disease known in English in the 20th century as anthrax, uh, which um, killed livestock very rapidly. It's a bacterial infection that by the 1760s and 1770s was understood to also be deadly to humans who ate the meat of these apparently healthy animals who simply laid down and died in the, in the field. When humans ate that meat, their deaths were really only understood to come from anthrax if they were uh, opened up in autopsy because the gastrointestinal form of the disease has no uh, telltale signs um, uh, externally. Next. And so by the 1770s and 1780s, I'm aware I'm uh, just have a few more slides here. By the 1770s and 1780s, it was clear to colonial practitioners that enslaved people were eating anthrax tainted meat. Uh, in the War of the American Revolution, as many as 15,000 people may have died by eating sun cured jerky made from the flesh of, of uh, cattle and other animals that died from anthrax. Uh, authorities were keenly aware of it. They diagnosed it. Next slide. And I've been able to trace in the north, uh, in the plain where the revolt broke out, the presence of anthrax and slave strikes in places like the Galafet Sugar Complex, the Morn Rouge Plantation, the Breda Eau de Cap Plantation, where Toussaint Louverture was enslaved, and the Noe Plantation, where the first fires of the revolution were lit on August 22nd uh, by Buchmann. Next. In the sugar plain, planters accepted grudgingly the anthrax diagnosis, but in the coffee zone, where anthrax was also endemic, planters refused to uh, relinquish their belief in a slave poison conspiracy. This was the very region where Mockendal had been arrested. And so in chapter six of the book, I talk about the terrible inquisitions and the acts of resistance that uh, occurred in the coffee hills in the 1770s and 1780s. And so final slide next, you can see that in fact, these sugar and coffee areas are exactly the areas where the revolution first broke out. And so I'm hypothesizing that these resistance communities were on the ground, had already faced terrible challenges and were ready to accept the terror, as Vince Brown says, the terrible decision that was foisted upon them to join the revolution as Paul Boleyn and Buchmann uh, uh, began to fight against the colonial slave regime. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry for going a little bit over, but um, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to hearing the comments of the other panelists. Thank you very much, John. It's a major new interpretation of the Haitian Revolution, and uh, unfortunately, my camera is 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 back on. Um, it's it's uh, it's a very rich and, and detailed uh, account, uh, and each of our panelists will spend a few minutes talking about some of the aspects which most uh, most interest them. Uh, can I first introduce you to Melanie Lamotte, who is a professor a professor of French uh, and history at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, she's an expert in the French colonial world uh, and has a forthcoming man manuscript, Making Race, Policy, Sex and Sexual Order in the French Atlantic and Indian Oceans, 1608 to 1756. Melanie, over to you. Thank you so much. So uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank John Gallagher for sharing his manuscript with us, as well as Trevor Berner, Judith Pickley and the Wilberforce Institute for organizing this event. 
A Secret Among Blacks uh, is a fascinating and beautifully written book. It tells the story of the free and enslaved men and women who over the course of 30 years prepared Saint-Domingue for revolution. The main argument of this book is that these men and women established multiple cultures of resistance, as well as social networks and loyalties, which they then leveraged during the Haitian Revolution. The social networks, which proved essential uh, to the Haitian Revolution, formed in different settings. On Sunday slave food markets, at festive slave gatherings, uh, in which participants danced the calendar, played drums, and offered food and drinks to spirits and attendees. And most importantly, these social networks formed when enslaved people tried to find solutions within their communities to the different environmental and material threats that they face, such as lack of food, epidemics, or a violent master. In particular, they were looking for medicine, objects which could protect them, and spiritual leaders who could perform African influence rituals for them. So as John just explained, resistance strategies differed between communities. Some communities uh, relied on African-inspired medicine to protect themselves from their enslavers' brutality. Others stopped working to paralyze their plantation. Some appealed to colonial courts to protect themselves from the tortures and abuse that they, their, um, of their enslavers using French legislation to their own benefits, and uh, especially Article 26 of the Code Noir of the Antilles, which forbade masters to torture and mutilate uh, their slaves. And some harnessed the power of the spirit of the dead uh, using objects and rituals. And only relatively few uh, enslaved people made poison to get rid of enemies. So the book follows a chronological development. So roughly the story starts uh, in the 1720s and it ends in 1791. And geography, and this was particularly from the presentation, is a crucial element uh, in this volume. And the maps provided in the book are really, really helpful. Geographically, the different events discussed in the book occurred within uh, restricted areas around foothills between sugar and coffee land. This terrain was struck by famine, epidemics, and poison interrogations. It was also a space where uh, slaves built strong communities within which there were important networks of sociability. Uh, it is on this very same ground that the Haitian Revolution broke in August 1791, and obviously John Gallagher shows us that this was no coincidence. Now, this is a major contribution to the field of Haitian studies for several reasons. Some have claimed that the only successful slave rebellion in modern history occurred within, um, in a colony uh, with no tradition of organized resistance. And this assumption uh, partly has to do with the fact that much of the historiography of Saint-Domingue and Haiti um, uh, focuses on the period beginning in the late 18th century. And this is where John Garrigus makes another important contribution to the historiography. His book is a much needed window into the brutal slave system that transforms Saint-Domingue into the world's leader's sugar supplier. In this book, reader will, readers will learn a lot about the daily life of the enslaved in the decades which preceded the Haitian Revolution their dances, their syncretic uh, spiritual or religious practices, their economy, as well as uh, the racism and the violence that they faced. And finally, scholars working on uh, other slave societies have refused to describe the enslaved as actual communities. Garrigus shows that um, this claim cannot be applied to Saint-Domingue, for which there is very strong evidence of community-driven life. So the content of this book is very rich and extremely engaging, so I have a lot of questions. And I'll start with the most obvious one. What distinguishes the history of resistance in Saint-Domingue from those of other French Caribbean islands which did not have a successful revolution in the end? Now, while writing this book, John Garrigus also faced a huge challenge. There are no slave narratives from Saint-Domingue, 
And many of the records from criminal trials have been destroyed or damaged by insect humidity and violence. Garrigus uses um, surviving court records, records of informal interrogations organized outside of court by slave owners, uh, legal memoranda and correspondence, all produced by colonizers. He looks for the voices of the enslaved, uh, deconstructing archival sources. Uh, so John, I was wondering if you could gu guide us through this process of deconstruction. I was also extremely impressed by John's ability to reconstruct the different bonds of sociability which tied the enslaved together into tight-knit communities. A pattern that I also noticed throughout the book was uh, how slaves within a, slave, a same community could also turn on each other, uh, reporting members of their communities during interrogations. So John, I was wondering whether you could tell us a little more about this. As John Garrigus explains in his introduction, this book is tied to an ongoing debate about what constitutes uh, resistance. In the late 20th century, a lot of publications have really celebrated slave resistance, drawing on a very broad definition of the notion of resistance. Resistance to them uh, encompassed escape, rebellion, and sabotage, as well as dance rituals. Uh, and private garden cultivation, for example. And uh, a lot of scholars actually still think of resistance in this way. But today, scholars such as uh, Frédéric Réjean and Randy Brown advocate for a much narrower definition of resistance, arguing that, quote, an exclusive emphasis on domination and resistance obscures the many other important relationships and conflicts that shaped enslaved people's lives. So John, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about uh, your take on the notion of resistance. And finally, uh, while reading this book, I found myself thinking about the work of black feminist scholars such as Angela Davis, who have highlighted the role played by women in the resistance of slave societies uh, in the Americas. So many of the figures of resistance and power we meet throughout the book are women. Most are domestic servants or menagères or hospitalières, uh, nursing uh, sick slaves on plantations. One of them, a woman named Kinge, a Congo woman who lived in Plaisance, performed divination to heal people. She also made objects with spiritual powers called garde de corps and had the power to identify poisoners among blacks. People in her community regarded her as, quote, a kind of God. And even white colonists would go to her uh, because uh, they were afraid of poisoners. So John, I wanted to ask, uh, how do you think about gender relations in the colonial society of Saint-Domingue and among slaves on the island? And what do you think about the link made by scholars such as Darling Clark Hines or Ernestine Jenkins uh, between resistance and masculinity? Uh, now, I really, really uh, enjoyed reading this brilliant book, and I highly recommend it to Caribbeanists, but also to anyone interested in the history of the era of revolutions, Black slavery and Black history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. That was that was fantastic. Um, just to just to mention that we uh, we we do encourage questions, um, and please send your questions uh, I, to, to to in in, in the spaces provided, and we'll try and um, uh, put them to John and to uh, the panelists at the end of the of of the presentation. Um, it's now my great pleasure pleasure to uh, introduce my old friend Laurent Dubois uh, from the University of Virginia. Uh, Laurent is the John, L John L L now third bicentennial professor in the history and principles of democracy at the University of Virginia, uh, having spent a long time at the University uh, Duke, Duke University and before that at Michigan State. Uh, he's a prolific author, uh, seven books at least and many articles. Uh, his most recent book from 2019, if, if I'm getting this right, Laurent, uh, is, is, is Freedom Roots, uh, Histories from the Caribbean. Uh, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Trevor. Thank you for all the staff at the Wilberforce Institute. It's really wonderful to be here today. 
um, and uh, to be part of this stellar a group of panelists as well. Um, and you know, thank you, Melanie, for starting us off so so brilliantly in, in in the conversation. Thank you, John, of course, also for for your book and for the presentation with the with the maps today as well. Um, so I want to think today with the book about the questions of how we tell the long history of the Haitian Revolution. And I really see this book as, as challenging us to think in, in lots of different ways about this revolution um, that we all are fascinated by. Um, obviously, since the age of revolution itself, those who have sought to narrate events of that period have always struggled with the tension between different types of chronologies. Um, a, revolution, a revolution is necessarily a kind of acceleration of history, and sometimes of time itself, it can seem like. Uh, something I, I thought of Walter Benjamin captures famously in his thesis on the philosophy of history in an anecdote about revolutionaries in 1830, irrité contre l'heure, firing on clock towers throughout Paris. Um, and it's easy and important when one writes about revolutions to get deep into the day-to-day, -day, sometimes even minute-by-minute -minute unfolding of transformative events. At the same time, of course, we know those events can and should be situated in a much broader time scale. The slow and tectonic cultural and intellectual processes that make it possible to imagine a different order and to act on that during a revolution, of course, unfold over decades um, and indeed sometimes in multi-generational time as, as we see in this book. Um, so the history of the French Revolution, for instance, can be seen as rooted in 17th century changes in state and society or even calibrated in relationship to the broad history of empire starting in the early 16th century. Of course, all these histories of revolution move forward too into our present, rendering our historical practice and imagination always in relationship to defining uh, futures from our, from our moment. Um, in the case of the Haitian Revolution, the complexities of nestling the accelerated history of the 1790s into a much broader set of histories is particularly complicated, both because we're talking about a, a multi-continental history, right? a kind of multi-continental story about Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean, and the Americas more broadly, um, and also by the very peculiar nature, which John engages with brilliantly, of what I would describe as an overwhelmingly hostile archive, right? An archive that is, uh, in contrast to some of the other revolutionary archives, overwhelmingly constituted, or very strongly constituted anyway, by, by very hostile accounts of what was unfolding. The cultural and intellectual foundations of the Haitian Revolution are Caribbean, they're European, and of course, they're also African. And the question of how, in particular, to narrate the Haitian Revolution as an African revolution has and is still creating plenty of debate and division amidst our ranks as historians. But it also strikes me as perhaps the most interesting and productive arena for historical work right now, not just on Haiti, but more broadly in the Americas. And, and John is clearly engaging in that conversation in, in very rich ways. So in Haiti, the basic demographic point that the majority of participants in the revolution were African born is crucial. So too is taking stock of the fact that for a significant number of these people for whom living in slavery in Saint-Domingue was a relatively brief period within a life that was largely anchored in Africa, and then pursued in, in revolutionary and post-independence Haiti or Saint-Domingue. Um, that group, I think, is, is, is interesting to think with as well. Um, to think of those individuals, notably primarily through the lens of slavery, of course, is, is myopic in a certain way. But it is also true that their intersection with the written archive that we historians privilege is entirely through that lens. Um, but on so many levels, that history, and it is a history that John compellingly tells here, is the critical one for understanding both the Haitian Revolution and post-independence Haitian culture and society. And I often think about the fact that we're thinking about the arc of lives, right, that stretch from the colonial, colonial Saint-Domingue through the revolution and into 19th century Haiti and forming that first generation of, of creating Haitian culture as well. Um, and this book, I think, really illuminates that, that story in, in new ways. John's focus throughout the book, particularly through his retelling of Macondal's story, um, is on the question of how communities of meaning and practice were shaped and reshaped, and how those enabled both certain kinds of social survival and ultimately revolutionary imaginings. Um, and I think he points us really in, in, in the right direction here. When John introduces Macondal on page 76, for instance, he notes that he was, quote, making objects that could heal the new land he lived in. The Macondas he made, he goes on, were seen by the community he helped to build to be objects that, quote, moved, spoke, revealed the future, and worked on behalf of those who fed and praised them. Tracing out in many different ways the complexities and contradictions of the practices of community gathering, spiritual engagement, and healing, um, and he also doesn't shy away from the division and, and intense conflict that, that, that was part of this world, um, he argues that these were in many ways the conditions of possibility for the larger project of political organizing and visioning that rooted the Haitian Revolution and made it possible. 
Um, and again, that kind of geographic specificity that, that he showed earlier, I think is so key here. As he writes in the final pages of the book, um, he's interested in writing about those who, quote, formed communities to access the power of an African spiritual world that surrounded them even away from their homelands. This capturing of the ways in which a spiritual world that crossed and transected the Atlantic, that made real and palpable through living objects, the link between landscapes of Africa and the Caribbean seems particularly vital and useful to me. As John ends his work looking ahead from 1804 to the process through which Haitians would, quote, make a world new for themselves, make, sorry, make a new world for themselves, this understanding of what they were building from and therefore towards is also vital. Now, the fact that John seeks to reconstruct this through a set of archives that are themselves constructed through a process of brutality and repression creates a whole set of questions and problems. And in reading, I kept thinking of Marie Vieux Chauvet's novel, Dance on the Volcano, recently translated by Kyle McGlover, which is set during the same period of the decades before the Haitian Revolution, and in many ways seeks to do some similar work to A Secret Among the Blacks in terms of thinking about that era. Chauvet herself was, of course, in deep dialogue with Jean Fouchard, who also struggled to think through how the cultural and intellectual worlds of Saint-Domingue shaped his Haiti and how white one might access them. And of course, Bouchard is referenced early on in the, in the book. Um, I thought though, in particular, not, not only of his uh, Maroons of Liberty, but of Les Marrons du Syllabaire uh, by Jean Fouchard, which engages deeply with the intersection of different communities and individuals, free and enslaved with writing itself um, and with the kind of the power of writing in their society. In John's book, we see primarily the enslaved through interrogations, um, drawing on Sophie White and in dialogue with her approach, he skillfully helps us read through the scribal traces of these moments to a broader sense of what likely was unfolding during those, during those conversations, right? And seeing how the kind of distortions and pressure and the uses of torture shaped what we have in the archive. Um, and I, I found that particularly compelling as a, as a methodological approach. I think this is particularly strong in showing us how deeply the imprint of European phantasms and fixations on poisoning that were themselves linked to a, to a whole set of histories in Europe, um, both legitimated, legitimated the forms of cruelty that were being exercised against the enslaved, and also at certain points made them blind to the scientific realities of disease that in fact many of those they were persecuting had at least some, some purchase on um, or engagement with. And I took from my reading of the book a powerful sense of how deeply the archive that now sits in Aix-en-Provence and Paris is a monument to the ways in which paranoid certainty can shape the legal structure um, and, and did at that time. I was also reminded of Jean Casimir's insistence that we always have to remember that at no point with the legal structure of slavery ever in fact legitimate in any kind of ethical sense, that it was always itself a construction forced on people through violence. Um, and that the enslaved had to navigate it strategically, even as they recognize it as in a way, not just unjust, but insane, right, in, in its own way. Um, and I'd love to hear more from John about his experience of encountering these archives and how he thought about building on them to tell a story that seeks in many ways to undermine and recast the stories that the legal documents were, were meant to tell or were trying to tell. Um, and I think here, if we can think of a lot of, a lot of other scholars that, that he's drawing with, uh, sort of speaking in dialogue with and doing that work. Um, so to conclude, this work is really crucial in terms of what it enables for us to, for us as we keep thinking through what kinds of histories can help us move more deeply towards understanding the Haitian Revolution from within all of its complex cultural conservances, convergences. Methodologically, it's a model for how to work with and through what we might call using a term developed in a different context by Dominique Julia, the archives of repression, right? So these archives that, that were used to repress certain things. Um, the way John both situates the archival documents and conditions under which they were produced, and still through them nevertheless reconstructs lives, destroyed in part through the very same process that produced the documents, is remarkable. That was a little, it's a little confused, but the idea that sort of he's, he's kind of turning these documents against themselves in the story that he tells, I think, is powerful. Um, I'll just end also by noting that the work dialogues, I think, critically and very fruitfully with that of Vincent Brown in his, his, his recent Tacky's Revolt book. Um, and that that dialogue might open up a set of questions about how we might think about the interconnections and intertwinings between the cultural and religious processes in Jamaica and Haiti during the second half of the 18th century. Um, there's obviously, I think, a larger story here, one that Julia Scott pointed to us, uh, us to long ago, um, that we're beginning to better understand of how these ideas for alternative futures emerged within and through linkages between these different struggles. Um, and it does strike me, it has struck me in reading uh, both The Plantation Machine by, by Trevor and John and also John's book in relationship to Vince's, 
but there's probably more room to think about how the events that unfurled uh, in Jamaica through Taku's revolt and broader conflicts there might have impacted and kind of open space for thinking uh, about, about particular kinds of revolts in Saint-Domingue. Um, and there's also much more to understand, but here, here this book really opens up a lot of questions here um, and interesting approaches of the cycle and impacts of the relationships between Haiti and both West and Central Africa throughout the late 18th century. Um, you know, topic about which I think there's there's so much to, to kind of explore and, and deepen. Um, and here, I think, following poten potentially some of the approaches that have been fruitful in Brazilian scholarship in thinking about these kind of loops uh, across the Atlantic between the Americas and Africa. Um, so I'll just conclude by thanking John. Uh, thank you so much for producing such a nourishing and important work. I know decades of, of research and thought have gone into this, and it's a really powerful contribution um, and one that's really going to res reshape the, our understanding of this vital historical moment. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Laurent. That was that was wonderful. Uh, I'd, like, I'd now like to turn to another friend of long standing, uh, Dominique Rogers. Uh, particularly, we'll be able to. We have a couple of people here who can who can give a, a Caribbean, and especially a French Caribbean uh, approach uh, a, a, a response uh, to John's book. Uh, Dominique uh, is professor at the University of the Antilles, uh, a prolific author, uh, and has been particularly interested in restoring uh, to public notice. Uh, narratives and other activities, uh, other other, other uh, sources written by the enslaved. Uh, Dominique, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Wilberforce Institute. Thank you. So, voila, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Dominique. Thank you. So, um, um, I was extremely pleased to have the opportunity to read John Garrigue's uh, book, uh, since I had the opportunity to well, I actually knew some of the of the figures, some of the characters that he that he's introducing in that he's discussing in the book, and some of them, uh, some the testimony of some of them being in my book, uh, What is Clave? And also because we had the opportunity, we discuss another project on the Macan around Macandal, and we and I was very happy to see how far um, he has he has gone from this first uh, experiences and. Uh, found uh, writing this uh, impressive and wonderful book. If um, The Secret Among the Black, A Secret Among the Black is for me a veritable tour de force, if I may say. It, it is uh, fully inscribed in the, um, it follows the book which has been done recently by people like uh, Sophie White, Trevor Bernard and myself on Voice of the Enslaved. It is really based on, on this kind of particular kind of archives, which were almost unknown uh, 10 years ago, and which are so important because it gave a very different image of the enslaved um, in the French historiography and in the French um, um, uh, general public, the um, a very miserable kind of discourse is still very dominant. And those kind of uh, documents um, allowing to hear the voice of the enslaved are really, really gives um, um, another view of, the, of their views and another view, uh, uh, give us the opportunity to know, to know them differently. So it is very, uh, as such, it is very important. Although they were all, of course, living in an extremely coercive system and they have little um, um, space of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of, of um, exercises their own, their own uh, will. Um, therefore, as a French person, I was a little, um, Therefore, as a French person who very lately discovered the notion of agency, I was a little um, um, surprised that this notion was not taken into account in the discourse of, uh, in, uh, uh, of, of, um, of John Garrigus. Um, what made this book very important is not only the fact that it, it let us discover all those characters and all those uh, acts of episodes of resistance during the last 30 years of the Ancien Regime, the old regime, but it's also the fact that uh, John manages to connect those episodes together, connecting, um, uh, connecting places, connecting individuals, connecting groups. And, uh, and therefore uh, giving us ground for the fact that all that happened in, in those places is really um, um, is our major elements 
explaining the revolution and making this um, the voice of the enslaved give us this image of agency, but connecting all those episodes uh, as he does allow us to go as much much further than what we could have um, anticipated. Uh, of course, some of those acts were not revolt, rebellions, revolts per se. They were, but they were real acts of resistance. Frédéric Rajan's point of view, which is mentioned in uh, in uh, in John Garrigus's book, um, is suggest that resist, the, re the resistance should be uh, limited to actions uh, while reducing productions or profits, uh, economic uh, production or profits. But I really, I mean, for me, it is a very, um, this vision, this definition relies on the very reductive, re reduced vision of what is slavery or what is an enslaved person. The masters impose his will to the enslaved not only on how they should produce economical uh, goods, but also on their individual liberty, their capacity of doing what they want to do, to choose their religion, to their to their choice, uh, the sociability, or even even imposing uh, choices in matter of sexual or part of my, on choosing the partner, uh, and therefore all the actions. Um, which uh, which the which the enslaved um, used to make choices in all those matters rely are um, either individual or collective choices um, should are included in the in the process of the ideas of uh, resistance. This does not mean that I do not agree with many of the scholars of my generation who think that we've been too far in the 60s, in the 1960s, the 1970s, resistance were everywhere and dances, you know, but some dances could be uh, action of resistance and some are not. So, so I do uh, follow this trend, but I think um, Mr. Rejean's definition was much, is much too, much too, much to reduce um, to to really um, be taken into account um, favorably in 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 the in the point we are trying to deal with. Um, excuse me. Reading the book, I was, however. Um, uh, had had some questions, I must say. One is something which I find a little maybe one of the point of the book is to say that there is a link between the the free blacks and the the enslaved and the African enslaved person, and the the and especially those the communities of the Lambe, Aku, Plaisance region, and the and one um, at one point there is. The book expresses the fact that there is a link between the free colored who were part of the Chavan and Oje re revolt and those African communities. And, um, and now, so there was two questions in one, I should say. Uh, the link with the free people of color, the free blacks is not, could be a bit more um, precise. Of course, we know of Jean-Baptiste Cap and of Toussaint Louverture. But I think the link, what are the, the, the common interests between, uh, on one way, the Chavan, the Auger and Chavan re, um, re, rebels and the African communities? This was not so clear to me, and I would like to have more information. So, common interest and how the link was made. Uh, second question. Um, uh, John has been talking a lot on uh, community. Um, on one hand, I keep on remembering that some communities, some and some slave and slave person during the beginning of the revolution refused to uh, to follow the rebel and stayed apart. Some were, were were killed for that, and some followed their masters. So this notion of community, I think it's interesting because they're. Uh, the, but I think I, I think it would be important to uh, maybe to to. Uh, to be pre precise a bit more on what you meant behind, I know that and, and, uh, that for a long time, community, the idea that the slave work considered as a community was challenged because, of course, the masters were doing all they could to to make to put um, um, a division between the enslaved. And I think what you you did prove so often how the enslaved refused to give the names of her. 
persons who helped them um, um, in, or, or participated to, the, to their uh, spiritual communities. But still, I think we need a bit more. I would love a little bit more on those questions. Um, um, you second, third points, maybe. Um, um, you did, you did, I think we, but that's more um, a desire, maybe that's for another book. We would have loved, I think, to know a bit more of the differences between the southern and the western part of Saint-Domingue, the enslaved or those parts and their relation to, um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to resistance and, um, and community, uh, community um, resistance. Com because, I mean, you succeed very, I think, at least for me, it was convincing uh, to see all the link between those enslaved persons from the North province. But we, then we would, and and it and you gave, I think, evidence, um, good evidence of this, uh, the implication it could have on the beginning of the uprising of 1791. But what about the differences with the others from the western part, especially the southern part, who started in January 1791? Western part being more started much later, and I think would have loved to understand what was different in the in the functioning of those commute of those enslaved persons of the west and the southern part. Um, and I think something which um, Melanie mentioned, which I think is really int and and is interesting, is the fact that the book does not only speak to us of the late part of the 18th of the of the 18th century, from which a lot of work has been done, but also introduce us to the early years of the 1720s, the 1730s, 40s, 50s, and that was very something very interesting and very needed. So thank you for that. Uh, also, a point which I enjoyed very much is the fact that this book allows us to know a bit more on the question of um, the evolution of the, on the, the poison and the uh, evolution of um, medical uh, knowledge in Saint-Domingue. And that was very interesting. We, we had work on, um, uh, um, on um, James McLellan and on uh, uh, Francois Rougour concerning this question of uh, um, science in the colonies. But there we, we had this discussion how things come little by little, how they were challenged, how the colonies were, were not seeing things in the same way. And I think that was very interesting as well. So although this is not the main part of the book, I think it was really a very important contribution. So thank you so much for that as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique. That, that's, 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 that, that was wonderful. Um, we, what we, we're, we're very keen in these, in these panels to include uh, scholars from all levels uh, of, of their career, and, and, and it's, and it's, a, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce uh, for our final two speakers two of the most exciting early career researchers uh, now working in Caribbean history. Um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce Melise, Melissa Ono George, who's a Britain Fellow at Queen's College uh, in Oxford. Uh, who's doing a number of number of projects at the moment, but one I could perhaps perhaps highlight uh, is she's working on the life uh, of an Afro-Jamaican woman uh, in late 18th century Jamaica and Britain, uh, and exploring not only her life, but the archives through which we can explore her life. So over to you. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Trevor, and thank you, um, uh, everyone else, for your really um, uh, intriguing and exciting comments and thank you um, John for for this book um, so I suppose I should start by saying I don't actually work on the Haitian Revolution and so um, I wasn't certain when I first started um, whether I would have any comments to or what the kind the kinds of comments I would have to share but I was really struck I think um, in reading um, about the archives, the way that John uses the archives, as several of the panelists have already um, sort of highlighted. So for several years, I've been thinking quite a bit about um, the way that we as academic historians um, construct historical narratives, how we piece together often fragmented sources, um, or problematic sources, fictitious source, sources, um, to craft a coherent argument or narrative. <coughs> So that history was something that uh, was crafted, a story of sorts, was something that was really obvious 
um, to me uh, at an early age. I'm, I'm from a Caribbean um, family and a Caribbean background and, and um, history is often discussed as, as a story and um, history writing and telling as storytelling. Um, but it's only as a graduate student when I read uh, Michelle Rolf Trio's Silence in the Past that the truth of this and what this might mean for the kinds of histories we are able to tell and how we're able to tell them that I recognize how important this question was for the histories of the Caribbean, histories of enslaved people, for histories of the marginalized. Um, and it was only then really that it struck me how incredibly political history writing is, whether we recognize that or not. So perhaps it's because of this that I've been um, so shaped by the works of scholars of the Caribbean and slavery who have questioned the very tools of history that um, uh, tools of history that when I read a secret or when I read a secret amongst the uh, amongst the blacks really stood out for me. Right. So this question about the archives really uh, is what came forward for me. So I was struck by the critical and creative way that John engaged the archives to tell a different kind of history of the Haitian Revolution, one that recognizes the resistant and everyday practices of, um, of the enslaved that laid the groundwork for what then occurred. And what I think uh, is made clear is that saint Demand was not, to quote, a colony with no tradition of organized resistance, but rather that historians have just not been able to see that. And it might be that we've just been limited, limited by the, um, the archives and the conventions of our discipline. But I think, um, or what, what uh, John quotes, he quotes Tia Miles, the conundrum of archive. And I think that's quite extensive in, the, well, it seems like very extensive in the case of uh, San Deman. But I think, um, as John also points out, there's a long list of more intentional obstructions um, I was really fascinated, actually. I think it's really incredible. And I wish in lots of ways, John, that you had sort of said more about this. I was fascinated of, um, of to learn about the several instances, instances throughout the 18th century where official French bodies ordered the intentional destruction of archival records related to the enslaved, such as criminal trials. And actually, when I was going back through my notes after reading, um, I think this is that one paragraph. I, I had a series of questions about, you know, the, what what they were actually thinking about, what were they worried about, um, uh, you know, that they that they had the thought that that, that it would somehow get them into trouble, um, I thought was really interesting. And again, speaks to the sort of politicized nature of archives, even in the 18th century. Um, so I think we should be in no doubt of the role that archives, their silences and absences have, have and have shaped, um, how much they have shaped what we know and can know about the past of enslaved people. Now, I know there is no explicit claim in the book about archives. So John doesn't claim to contribute or wade into discussions and debates about how we work with sources or the silences and absences. Uh, these are discussions that I think are being led um, quite beautifully, if I, if, I, if I may say so, by Black feminist historians such as uh, Marissa Fuentes and Tina Miles, Jennifer Morgan, and of course, uh, Sadia Hartman. But there's a recognition, I think, in this book of uh, the scaffolding, what my one of my previous uh, uh, supervisors referred to as the scaffolding of history, the scaffolding of the craft um, in the use of speculative language, what we might, what might have been, what one perhaps believed or thought. In most cases, um, there is this thinking, or I see in John's writing and in this book, there's a thinking about the archive as an object, a reading of the archives against the grain or rather sideways and a more ex uh, expansive consideration what, of what was likely possible. And what is revealed um, by a recognition of the quote, the fantasy written in fiction is an understanding I think of the fine details, the nuances that would um, often and have often been missed. And including, uh, and this includes, I think, the, this quite vast, um, uh, quite full cast of historical actors that enabled the, the revolution, that enabled the revolution, um, but also sort of the diverse range of practices. And I think a recognition of these individuals that perhaps would not have been would not have been possible without the kinds of engagement with the archives um, that we see in this book. So move away from narratives. Um, and I, I guess this is one of the things I really liked. And, and maybe I haven't read, um, I mean, I know I haven't read as extensively um, 
uh, in terms of archives or even in terms of secondary sources about the Haitian Revolution. Um, um, but I was really sort of impressed by the way that uh, John moves away from narratives of sort of um, the singular or the spectacular. And mostly, sorry, the singular is spectacular and mostly men. So there's a clear recognition in this book of the quite vast contributors or contributors, uh, men, will, women, but also um, quite importantly, I think the environment in uh, sort of laying the foundation for the revolution. So lastly, I just want to um, briefly um, raise the question around speculation. That is speculation that is grounded in archive. Um, and I mean here the articulation of what may have been, what one may have thought or believed, what Natalie Zimmon Davis once referred to as the perhaps in history. So creative interpretations that allow us to move beyond its sort of the limitations of archive strategies that are necessary in histories such as this, such as this one. So histories of the marginalized, histories where the archives are thin or mediated. Um, when John sort of speculates on Amidor's beliefs, for instance, why the captive may have called his interrogators back um, from lunch early, or John writes that Amidor uh, lost hope in his enslaver's willingness to protect him, for instance. Um, so I'm quite struck by this kind of speculative language. And I wonder about how far this can, um, how far this sort of moves us beyond the constrained and mediated wor words of the planter or authored sources. Um, how much does this allow us to, um, well, I, actually, I think John does this really well in this book, um, but I'm thinking about this in terms of my own work and some of the other uh, studies that I've been reading on uh, enslaved people in the Caribbean, but how, how much does this actually allow us to, um, to paint a sort of broader picture of the humanity of the enslaved? So the history that John crafts then, I think, um, really does demonstrate that the, the, the Haitian Revolution wasn't something that was unthinkable, but it was something that was actually, quite frankly, uh, inevitable in lots of ways. Now, the, the kinds of questions, so my question um, in thinking about the archive and thinking about speculation has to do with the place that I think the Haitian Revolution has in sort of wider discussions around um, in Black diasporic studies, in so not just, in the not just in Caribbean studies, but Black diasporic studies. And I think that the Haitian Revolution actually has quite a foundational, um, it's quite foundational in this field. And it's um, the legacies of that, it's often sort of referred to uh, when we're thinking about Black resistance and um, sort of traditions of, of radical uh, resistance. Um, and so I want to ask John about his own process um, when thinking about and engaging with the archives whether he was also thinking about um, sort of the politicized nature of writing in this way about this event that is in itself um, really um, quite politicized beyond historians and beyond uh, Caribbeanists. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. And, and finally, uh, we'll move over to uh, Dex Moore Peters. Just to remind everybody uh, that, that if you wish to ask questions, and a few, of people, few people are doing that already, there's a chat function uh, which allows you to, to put those questions in, and I'll put, I'll put those to uh, John and the panel. Um, Dexnell is uh, a lecturer at the University of the West Indies uh, in Mona, in Jamaica, from where he joins us. Uh, he is an expert uh, in, in particular in the Greater, Greater Caribbean, and in particular in, the, uh, in what we might call the Southern Caribbean, Trinidad and, and places like that, uh, particularly in the period of the French Revolution uh, and the Napoleonic Wars. Um, over to you, Dex, now. Thank you very much, Trevor, and to the Wilberforce Institute for inviting me to this summer debate. Um, when I was first asked to review this book, I very happily accepted, in particular because I'm due to teach a new course that I designed on the Haitian Revolution and its legacies across the globe next semester. And I now have uh, what I think is a very rich and accessible source to further flesh out the prehistory of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, I really felt that the book continues to reveal the rich and fertile ground that remains in the study of the Haitian Revolution. It certainly adds to the argument that the revolution was not a kind of sudden rupture or departure in a fresh way, I felt. I also appreciated, and others have mentioned this before, the special focus on enslaved Africans and free Blacks through the fleshing out of individual stories. Uh, it shows the continued possibility of unearthing these stories despite the often challenging archival records. 
So as a historian of the Atlantic world, with particular interest in the Greater Caribbean, I read this book while considering the extent of the exceptional nature of this narrative of slave and black resistance, of enslaved and black resistance in saint Uh, In John's earlier monograph, Before Haiti, which is another book that I quite enjoyed, uh, he, had, he identified the unique nature of saint Lamont's uh, economy, terrain, and population, especially this emerging class of wealthy free people of color and a kind of mid-century, mid-18th century shift in treatment towards them. Uh, but unlike the focus of that book, which highlighted something that made uh, the colony stand out, it strikes me that in this book, there's potentially a more translatable story of slave and black resistance that could be considered elsewhere in the Greater Caribbean. And I suppose one potential question, and I think it's it's very much linked to what Melanie asked earlier on, um, would be the, what aspects of this narrative of resistance and the building of communities prior to the Haitian Revolution that John would consider to be particularly exceptional to Saint Uh The rest of my comments, I'm going to sort of highlight at least three areas flowing from the book that I think deserve further attention across the region, and in particular, some of the places less represented in this geography. Um, uh, uh, my three areas I'm going to focus on is the development of ritual or sort of resistance communities, uh, the tracing of extensive regional networks, and the emergence of a free black political movement to challenge white supremacy. Uh, to begin, I appreciated the argument in the book about the development of you know, these different forms of resistance communities among the enslaved and the, the black population. And the ways in which these communities and the long rooted networks may very well have paved the way for the mass mobilization that occurred during the Haitian revolution. I felt the book provided a really interesting framework here that might have relevant relevance across the wider region. A close analysis or interrogation of um, interrogation or court records and the teasing out of these networks is the kind of work that could be very fruitful if done in some of the lesser written about territories of the Caribbean, though I know records do vary across the board. John in the book provides, you know, uh, just to give a quick example, comparisons to the practitioners of Cuban Palo and the kind of community building that occurred there that may have been similar to the community developed by Mackendall. And of course, Cuba has got more attention than some of other, the other, some other places in the Caribbean in particular. But just one example of the kinds of similarities linking back to this question of the exceptional nature of this story. Uh, though this book ultimately served to help explain some of the factors that facilitated the revolution, it strikes me that this kind of work is also helpful uh, beyond seeking to explain large-scale revolts, insurrections, or eruptions across the region, but in a full range of other forms of collective resistance or survival strategies that did not eventually lead to large eruptions. I was especially interested in the rationale provided the development of some of these communities. Um, uh, and you mentioned, John, they sought to survive food shortages, mutual work regimes, epidemics, poisoning investigations, et cetera, and how these communities could often find somewhat suitable collective solutions. Ultimately, I think the book provides a good model for the deeper examination of resistance and community building in the Greater Caribbean. I felt that the secret among slaves provided a very rich account of the extent of regional networks and the ways in which they potentially developed on the island. I really appreciated the details of McCandle's extensive network of followers, for example, and I could not help think about the potential for his followers to extend beyond the island. Um, and I know there are teasers of McCandle, even in Ada Ferrer's um, Freedom's Mirror, but you know, uh, perhaps this kind of study with other notable figures in mind um, uh, might have more fruit in some of the intensely interconnected or more entangled spaces, such as the clustering of smaller islands or proximate island mainland territories. Uh, finally, I appreciated the focus on the political culture of the free Black and enslaved Africans. And I have a special interest in this area because I recently wrote a piece comparing political culture in the French and British Caribbean slave societies. Um, I felt a, a highlight of this book was the inclusion of the thinking of free Blacks, uh, which provided an important addition to the rich political movement of free coloreds in Saint-Domingue, as you've already done 
well done. And certainly free blacks were also mobilizing and enslaved Africans, no doubt, would also be swept up across this very rich political environment. The idea of collective scheming to increase the free black population to confront whites is one that I think also deserves further attention across the Greater Caribbean. If in the turn of the 19th century, we see this increase of official free colored petitions for political rights across the region, no doubt ideas as those expressed by Medor were not isolated to San Demar. Um, Laurent already mentioned um, Julia Scott and these sort of networks um, that we see happening in the region. Uh, all in all, I think this book is a very important contribution to the historiography of the revolution, but also to enslaved and black resistance in the Greater Caribbean. I believe it provides a useful model for the kind of work that should be done elsewhere, and especially where no major eruptions occurred within Greater Caribbean slaves. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Dex. No, that was that was great. If I could ask the members of the panel to to Put on their cameras again, uh, and when we will be able to ask some questions uh, of the of of John. But please, uh, panelists, join in uh, this particular particular occasion. There are, there are any number of questions which came up from the panelists them, themselves. Uh, but perhaps I could start off with a, with some questions uh, for, from the uh, from from the audience. Uh, we have an, have a question from Anne Aller, which asks that in terms of connections between these different landscapes. Uh, do you, I think she's referring, asking you, John, in particular, do you also see meaningful connections into towns as important in the lead up to the revolution? Uh, and, she th and, and she says maybe we might want to compare Aisha Finch's work on gun running networks in Cuba. Uh, so are there connections between the towns and the importance in, in, in the lead up to uh, the <clears throat> revolution? Yeah, I. Um... You know, this book is really constructed around the evidence of poison generated by the poison accusations of both the Mockendals era and on into the, uh, the, the, you know, 1788 and the eve of the revolution. And those don't really have a lot of evidence about what, what was happening in the, in the towns. And I think that's a, would be a, I mean, Dominique already in her work has done such incredible uh, it was just such incredible uh, labor to lay out the communities of free blacks and uh, recently manumitted people in the um, in the Caribbean, uh, in, in Cap Francais and the area, areas around it. And I think that's probably you know the next the next uh, step. We have a, an amazing um, uh, some new work being done on the new GIS work being done on the geography of Cap Francais and the specific locations using the cadastral survey of the town and I really think um, I think that life of uh, enslaved and free black people in the towns is kind of the next frontier for this for this study so uh, um, I mean, yeah, I'm afraid I don't really have any light to shed on on the town a question from Paul Cheney, and I think this is something not just for John, but also I think the panel would be, uh, we'd be interested in your views, which is particularly on uh, voodoo, voodoo uh, about and 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 about how how radically he asks, are you prepared to interpret the religious practices of the enslaved? We're, how do we uh, think about voodoo? Uh, do we think of voodoo as something is working for the reasons that scholars say it do, say it does? Uh, creating diverse bonds of solidarity, or do we want to go further? Should we think that voodoo works in calling on spirits to aid enslaved uh, in persons uh, against enemies? And so I'd, I'd be interested, I guess, in the panel's response in general uh, to something which is hugely important in John's work, which is the role of religion and African religion in general uh, in thinking about resistance. Do you want to start, John? Yeah, I mean, I'll start in the sense that, uh, I mean, for me, the most important consideration uh, is the uh, foundational importance of community for, you know, people in San Domingue, the people from Africa um, needed to recreate uh, families and communities and uh, needed to cre recreate their spiritual communities as well. Um, and so, I primarily see Vodou being, uh, you know, a, a, an incredibly powerful tool, and I, I wouldn't even call it Vodou, of course, because we don't really see that label uh, used until the very, very end of the of the period, even though just before the revolution. But uh, I mean, also the idea 
that so must have been so powerful for people in Saint-Domingue of living in a sick place. I mean, a place that was, that was of course, you know, sick in the sense of the, the particular forms of slavery and the brutality that so many people have documented, but sick in the sense of, of some powerful force stalking the land, killing the animals, killing the people, um, and then the powerful whites using their ability to, to torture the blacks and to, uh, in, into revealing uh, sorcerers among the black population. I mean, that, that um, I mean, this, this is to me what's extraordinary about Saint-Domingue is that the presence of anthrax imported by the French and part of, uh, you know, really nurtured in a place that, of course, as we know, uh, ate up the lives of people, but also enslaved animals. I mean, there's a kind of a slave trade in animals who are brought in, not to compare people and animals, though certainly colonists saw them in that way, but animals are brought in by the hundreds of thousands and their bodies simply you know, used up and then discarded. And that attitude is what that process, that capitalistic attitude towards all these bodies as being simply tools of production, human animal, non- yeah, sorry, human animals and non-human animals alike made this place extraordinarily profitable and extraordinarily sick in a deep spiritual way that, uh, you know, it's no wonder that people called on Mackandal and others to find what spiritual powers, what deep kinds of sorceries were underlying this situation. And so, uh, yeah, for me, it's primarily a community building uh, exercise, but uh, I, I do want to stress like the extraordinary nature of the situation from a spiritual point of view. Would anyone else in the panel like to, like to uh, make some further comments on religion and the, its role in the beginnings of the Haitian Revolution? Um, I'll add some thoughts if they, oh, sorry, was someone else? No, you go ahead, Laurent. Um, I thought this was just, this really got me thinking and reading your book on so many levels. You know, some of it is because you're describing a kind of, you know, on the kind of colonist side, of course, too, right? There's a whole, I mean, the, the, the question of how one sees the world and one's place in it and the spiritual and which, I mean, all these sorts of things, right, that are, um, it, it can, I think sometimes people imagine there's a kind of like Western rationalism and vodou or something, which obviously, you know, I think that's that would be the wrong way to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's important. And then the other, though, I really think with the question of religion is that if, you know, the, the, the madness of the system that people are being brought into. Um, and again, I mean, Jean, Jean Casimir writes about, you know, so what to try to reconstruct, like being brought into this completely illegitimate system, um, that is a form of madness in a way. Um, and then needing to reconstitute some kind of reality, right? Some kind of grounding in humanity, uh, in a system that is that is ripping apart humanity in all kinds of ways. And then I also think that very important because politics is about you know the past and the future, right? It's about it's about sort of having a sense of one's trajectory. And so I do think the religious context, because of the connections to Africa, but also the forming of community, is allowing people to imagine first of all that they have a history that is not slavery, right? That they, that, that they are part of, they're part of a historical trajectory um, that has other pasts than what, what this, the slave plantation would say, which is really just the middle passage, right? Or the kind of, you know, the removal of your humanity. And then the, the, uh, the possibility of futures that are different, right? Because um, I think, for, except for the tiny stream of emancipation that was, av was available, like a future, you know, to kind of join essentially the, 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 the system outside of slavery. Otherwise, there was no sense of a future outside the plantation. Um, and it feels like Vodou was nourishing that kind of set of possibilities, right? Because then you could imagine, like, what if the community we're forming could do what it wishes, right? What if, what if the families that we want to form could live on a particular place of land, right? And then, you know, and when you look ahead, you can really just see that that is exactly what people systematically did after, as soon as they were emancipated, and certainly after Haitian independence, right, was to constitute an alternative reality that was humane, you know, that had families that, uh, in which you could bury your your people and go to their graves, in which, you know, all, all the things that the Laku system kind of allows. So I, I guess it just feels like the, I like that you come in strongly on that sense, because I think it's so important. And it's, and sometimes the conversation has, feel, feels according to 
I, it's, it's, it just re, your book helps, I think, recast the conversation in so many ways. So, sorry, that was a little long, but. <laughs> Great. Perhaps, we, perhaps we can move to another subject which came up in, in several of the discussions, um, which was is, is the role of archives. Uh, but both Melanie, Melissa, Laurent, uh, Dominique, all of you talked about uh, the various things, what, what Laurent calls the, the, the particularly hostile nature of the archives. And Melissa draws from that the idea that, that this might mean that the Haitian Revolution uh, was not unthinkable, which is a nod to Michel Ralph Trullo, uh, but is but was perhaps was was inevitable given the particular nature of the archive. And Dominique has a number had a number of questions also uh, about the archive, as did Melanie. I just I just wanted John if you could perhaps give us some idea of of the sources you've used, uh, how you would think about the particular archive, how you would respond to Laurent's idea. Uh, that the archive is uh, overwhelmingly hostile, mm -hmm. uh, and his comment, quoting, jo, quoting John, John, John Casimir, uh, that slavery was itself illegal, so the archive itself reflects that 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 archive of the illegality sustained by 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 violence, uh, and, and some of the questions that Melanie had uh, about what this what this does about our, allowing us to look at enslaved resistance. So, would you be able to tell us a good deal about more about uh, the advantages, the problems, what you see the archive, particularly in relationship to the various questions that panelists have brought forward to you. Yeah, so many, so many good questions, and I, I just have to say, the the my approach to the archive is kind of shaped by two ideas in my head, um, and one of them is from Laurent. Uh, it's uh, from your roots of liberty that you and Rich uh, Turrets wrote, and in the beginning of that book, you say, in writing the history of the Caribbean, you're either you know, you're either uh, on the ship with Columbus or you're on the beach waiting to see what is going to happen. Um, and that 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 metaphor was so powerful. And in in, as I wrote this book, and I just, you know, I could have sort of made that political decision as uh, Melissa uh, describes it's like, you know, I want to tell the story from uh, the perspective of the people on the beach, um, not the people on the ships, which, of course, is a is a real challenge for those of us raised as French, trained as French colonial historians. The other, the other influence was from the Carnegie Foundation, which gave me two years to, to, to work on writing and asked me to consider writing this book uh, for a wider audience. So I kept sort of coming at this, trying to write from the, the way we're trained. Like, what are the documents? Who created the documents? Or what were the pressures on the people who created the documents? And I kept finding myself, you know, writing from the perspective of Columbus, you know, the men on the ship. Which was not the perspective that I wanted to write about. I mean, I know so much about Courtin, for example, the man who interrogated Macandal and Assam. Uh, but in the end, I decided just to put that in a footnote because it's not about Courtin. Um, but I mean, Courtin's interrogation of Macandal is you know, the, maybe the best example of an archive that, uh, you know, people talk about Macandal, but I don't think anyone, very few people had really looked at the actual interrogation record or actually the, on the memoranda. That uh, that Courtin wrote. Uh, here's a here's an ambitious a lawyer with a chance to get a, become a full time judge if he could only prove that Mockendal is at the center of a vast con uh, poisoning conspiracy, and he can't find any evidence of it. The entire I don't know, 20 page or no, longer than that uh, uh, memorandum you know, gets into all the details of Mockendal's spiritual practice. Uh, and makes it clear that it's a Congo-inspired practice. It doesn't involve the West African kinds of medicines that other people are using. It's all about creating power objects. And so here's someone, you know, basically they convict Makandal based on the fact that he buries, he wraps uh, uh, Jesuit crucifixes in some of these power objects. And that's blasphemy, which is a burning offense in, in French law. So there's a good example of Makandal being accused and convicted of being a poisoner, a story that's been repeated for 200 years and the very document that we have that supposedly, you know, informs that uh, conviction. It's completely, uh, you know, completely in contradiction with that. So after I began looking at that, then I began to go back to all the, all the documents and, and, and realize, I tried to look at Mockendall's interrogation from his perspective, Medor's interrogation, 
from his perspective. Um, and I, I just had to stop talking about documents and I had to stop talking about the people who created those documents, even though I thought about it a lot. And I had to put Mockendahl in the center and I had to put Medor in the center and I had to sort of tell, and this is a, thanks to, you know, uh, L Laurent's metaphor, I had to sort of put the people on the ground at the center and, and take the colonists on their ships out of, out of it as much as I could. Thank you. Thanks, John. I, I, I'd like to move in a, in a minute or two to Melanie and Dexnell's uh, idea about uh, what model is for other, other Caribbean communities, and perhaps also to Melanie's uh, question about, uh, I think with also Melissa as well, about the role of women uh, in this thing. But we, we, have had, we have had a question from Eric Hinderacher, which fits very much with a question uh, from Dominique, which was a question about uh, community. So just let me give up this up to, to why am I, why is this not working? Uh, but but, but, but uh, Eric wants to ask about um, community in particular uh, in, 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 in the Caribbean. Just let me try and get this up on, on, on screen. Um, he asked about, he's curious about the idea of community, which implies continuity, memory and membership. With the, emphasis, any, with the emphasis many scholars have placed on the high death rates and very high levels of ongoing importation of enslaved pe people in the decades leading up to 1791. And I think, th th think this fits very much with Dominique's question. How was community constructed and, emotion, uh, constructed and maintained under such dire circumstances? And he adds as a su supplementary as well, is what importance does your book attribute to the emphasis John Thornton has placed on the military training of the enslaved in San Domingue? Do you see that as an important element in the creation of commu communities of resistance? Okay, well, yeah. Um, I would have to say that I, uh, you know, in telling these stories, obviously these communities were secret. They were communities that needed to be secret and only in a, a few rare occasions, for example, a kalenda that was held after a man uh, uh, who had been jailed for years was finally released and there's a kalenda and, and uh, his man the manager is fined for allowing this, this celebration. Do we really begin to get a glimpse of a community that for the most part absolutely had to um, uh, exist in secret? I, I'm deeply inspired by what Vince Brown did in Tacky's Revolt, which was to use the geography and the movements of people across the land as a way of reading, uh, reading their intentions, reading the persistence of communities. And so what happened was I, I was writing, uh, I was tracing these poison ex, ex, uh, these, these poison inquisitions and finding the locations of all these people on the maps. And then my editor said, this book needs to have a kind of connection to the Haitian Revolution. Um, and I began to, I read Jean-Louis Donadieu's extraordinary article where he talks about the strike on the Noe plantation. I discovered, thanks to the Rossignols, that Buchmann Dati was really Buchmann Duti, and the Clement plantation was actually the Duti plantation. And I began to realize that all the stories that I've been tracing in the pre-revolutionary period, I, this just fell into my lap. They were all located in this 25 mile radius of the Duty and the Noe plantation, and they corresponded pretty much exactly to the Lambe River Valley and that corner of the Akal Parish. And so, in response to Eric's uh, question, that's my evidence of, of community is that seeing those secret communities come alive on the map um, and realizing that it took, it was that the revolution depended on far more than a Morn Rouge meeting on August 14th and a, a Bois Caimont meeting on August 21st, that those communities uh, had been active for, for years and the map show it. And then one more thing, because this is what Melanie raised, such an important point about the role of women in, in these communities. Uh, you know, the book tells, the uncovers the stories of a diverse group of women, um, King Gay, who Melanie mentioned, but Agnes, who was head of a of a household at the ground zero of outbreak of poison allegations. Lizette was a freed woman who purchased her son's freedom. And then when the son was accused of poisoning and was re-enslaved, re she fought to enforce the manumission of laws. You know, uh, an enslaved child named Mary Jane, who's protected by a broad community, which mostly consists of enslaved women. I mean, the, the role of women in these networks is uh, so clear and their role in you know, building and perpetuating and fighting um, 
is uh, not in a military sense, but in uh, this, all these other senses is, uh, I think, a, a really central part of the book. Thanks very much, John. Uh, we have a question, which is moving on to something different, different uh, topic, which is really about uh, uh, the connection between your work and, I guess, uh, contemporary contemporary affairs. Sam North asks, uh, what role have heritage organisations played in airbrushing the role of voodoo in slave resistance? And perhaps we can combine that with a question from Alyssa Seppenwell, uh, which is, which she, she gives gives greetings from the West Coast, and she asks, uh, if you've had a chance to present your rep reinterpret reinterpretation of Mackendale uh, to Haitian scholars, uh, and what what the reaction was to that? Yeah, thanks, uh, Melissa, for that. Sorry, Alyssa, for that that question. I I, uh, I have some Haitian American friends who sort of saw an early early version of my attempt to understand Mackendale's poison, and they they sort of laughed at me, and they were right. Uh, they were right. I had an earlier vision, which uh, was in the book Trevor and I published, uh, where I tried to uh, explain the deaths uh, because of the problems in the food supply, uh, maybe the possibility of moldy wheat. Um, but no, I really haven't had a chance to uh, to uh, to talk to Haitian Americans or Haitians to, uh, about my interpretation. I mean, I think some people, the, the friends that I first presented this to, saw me as decentering Mackendal. Um, uh, and uh, sort of neutering him, but what really, what in a way, what I want to do is clear his name of uh, this kind of uh, sociopathic ac uh, accusation that he was responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of fellow enslaved people, and really restore his prominence with evidence that he was the earliest person that we know of who was bringing Congo-inspired practices. Uh, that would go on to become part of Haitian Vodou. Um, uh, and, you know, the fact that the Haitian Revolution, because I located him on the map, takes place in the very area around Soufriere, where he was most active, you know, really provides proof that Makadal is at the center of the Haitian Revolution, but in a much more spiritual, profound, you know, community building way than the, than the, uh, the colonial legend of the Lord of Poison. Great, thanks. Um, Doug Hamilton asks, um, do you see patterns of resistance among particular African groups or associated with newly arrived enslaved people? Or do the communities you outline cut across enslaved people of different African origins? Yeah, it's very hard to find the African origins of the people in um, what we need, the little that we know of Mackendall's followers and, and, and others. Uh, I think the most important uh, story for me, the one that the title of the book comes from, is the story of Medor and uh, his revelation that he was working with a group of free Blacks who we know very little about uh, to uh, use African-inspired medicines. And this seems to be a, maybe a more of a West African than a, uh, than a West Central African uh, tactic, to use medicines to uh, soften the hearts of enslavers and uh, lead to manumissions that would eventually create a larger free black population. So that there does seem to be this emphasis on medicines and the people that surround uh, Medor and supply him are, uh, are are largely West African. And what's one of the things that's unique about Mackendal when he arrives on the scene is he's the first person in the surviving record that they interrogate who's not West African who actually ironically is not dealing in medicines. He's dealing in spiritual objects. And so there definitely is that distinction between the West African and the West Central African in that story of the Mackendal investi investigation. But for the later period, um, we lose, sort of tend to lose sight of the West Africans and people like King Gay and others are clearly practicing Congo style uh, 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 tactics and people in Marmalade and in the coffee zones are heavily Congolese. Um, and and they're looking to those heritages to protect them from both their enslavers and the mysterious death. Great, thanks, John. Dave Dave Ryden asks, uh, were planters in the 18th century were, were planters in 18th century Saint Domingue ever anxious about foreign influence, especially the British, inciting slave resistance, uh, like the planters of Jamaica, or was the upward upwind orientation of a colony, did that work for Saint-Domingue planters, giving them more confidence in their ability to control the people they enslave? Yeah, wow, that's really, really interesting. Um, uh, 
I do think, and I, I know Trevor, I heard Trevor remark on this uh, in the, uh, the Wilberforce discussion of Vince Brown's book, I do think that uh, the French saw themselves ironically as, uh, as better, kinder masters than the English and uh, the, the news of, of the uh, Tacky's Rebellion and the horrible punishments meted out uh, in Jamaica um, you know, came to San, to San Domingue as kind of uh, as kind of proof to the French that somehow they were a better sort of master. And yet, you know, beneath the surface, that then was this troubling affair of 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 poison. And you see in you know, planters writing in the early years of the revolution that it was only a few bad planters who had this problem with poison. And um, and so there's definitely a, a planter discourse. A sort of a nationalistic discourse of, of the French are better and more humane, but of course that then they have to explain the revolution, um, and it's you know there, then there's the the uh, what Marlene Dowd calls the uh, the mulatto revenge uh, theory, and there are a bunch of other sort of colonial myths that emerge to explain you know how France how this could happen to uh, a French plantation regime that was supposedly so good. I mean, and the conclusion I talk about. Uh, a planner named Pierre Mossu, who, who later wrote, he said, how could we ever known that there reigned among these men, so numerous and formally so passive, such a concerted accord that everything was carried out exactly as it was declared. Mossu asked that, even though he had personally put down a strike on his plantation that involved two dozen men that he personally branded, uh, men who were absent from the plantation for, for weeks on end and knew what was Going to, going to happen to them. So there was this, this attempt very early on in the French colonial memory to say, you know, why is this happening to us? It's impossible to conceive of. Uh, the slaves were always passive and there must have been uh, not so much a foreign influence, but you know, abolitionists, uh, ungrateful mulattoes, quote unquote, uh, or others who you know, caused, uh, caused our downfall. Thank, thanks, John. John Kui Min asks, uh, first of all, he thanks you very much, uh, John, for your talk. And he said he was particularly struck by the idea that the resistance arose in response to environmental dangers such as anthrax. And it'd be good to you to talk about anthrax a bit more and would like to know more about it. In what specific ways uh, did, in, did, in what specific ways uh, were enslaved people's attempts to find solutions to environmental dangers? To what extent did that cons constitute, constitute resistance and help them cre create diverse networks. So it's, it's very central to your book uh, yeah. and, and to your theory, uh, Anthrax and Resistance. Yeah, I mean, I, um, the, the, the wave of deaths uh, was inexplicable to colonists and to enslaved and free people as well uh, in the 1750s and 60s and on into the uh, 70s. Um, as it turns out, you know, enslaved people were working with livestock. Uh, they were, of course, starving because the plantation regime was was designed to sort of, uh, uh, you know, work that way. Um, and they were the ones who were eating the meat of animals that were apparently healthy uh, that died suddenly. They were also people looking for medicines, looking for the powers of the new land. And so there's a number of cases where where enslaved doctors and others created medicines using anthrax. Uh, and there are at least two cases in the book where it's clear that people understood that the plants that animals were grazing on that killed them had incredible power. Um, interestingly enough, there's no evidence that they used that ag against their enslavers, though that's always a possibility. It's always a possibility. Um, but they more than more than colonists sort of were investigating the actual conditions in the land that were causing these deaths and trying to explain them, and of course, in spiritual terms and other terms. Uh, and then they were probably uh, trading these medicines and, and exchanging and selling these medicines. And this is what probably happened to Medor. There was a network of medicine makers um, and, and of course, uh, the colonists use the word poison, which is a very ambiguous term. So I'm translating that as medicine here. Uh, and some of those medicines were probably involved uh, involved uh, actual anthrax, uh, and that was um, that was certainly a part of the growing hysteria among everybody in the island about poison. 
Gash Hume has a related question. Uh, he thanks for, thanks for this presentation and greetings to all, he says. Mm -hmm. How do you connect the sickness of Sandemang, especially anthrax, with the patterns of resistance you describe? Uh, and I suppose that, 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 that this fits into one of the contributions your book makes, which is to the growing recognition that plantations, environment, uh, environmental history in particular, is a, is, is a particularly vital part of, of uh, Caribbean history. Uh, so where would you put anthrax and resistance? Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, obviously the Haitian Revolution occurs to, you know, from, from an extraordinary uh, historical conjuncture, right? Events in France, uh, a whole host of other uh, uh, you know, powerful yeah, and, and, forces. And just, and just to inter interrupt, but Mike Turner asks, how, how can the, ask the panel, I guess, how effective slavery scholars have been engaging with environmental factors and slave economies. So perhaps if uh, if you have your response and then ask the panel about uh, how, how well you think slavery scholars are, are incorporating e environmental history into their works. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I think anthrax was was almost exclusively present in French territories uh, and not in uh, not in the British islands and uh, only in the Spanish territories like Santo Domingo that were adjacent to, to San Domingue. And so in that sense, there were some very Specific specific environmental conditions that were exacerbated by the provisioning problems, uh, which was were also in, you know the problem of growing food, which was also an environmental slash political issue in the French world. So, so yeah, uh, those were some things that were highly specific to Saint Domingue, Martinique, and Guadeloupe, environmentally speaking. Does anyone in the panel want to uh, to, to to answer Mike, Mike's question about how well slavery scholars are dealing with environmental history? Dexnell, Melanie, uh, Melissa, as, 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 as more as early career scholars, would you would you have, have something to say here, Melanie? Okay, uh, so there was another aspect, I think, to the question, which was about the slaves' economy, right? Did I hear that right? So, 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 uh, how slavery scholars are incorporating and dealing with environmental history in their work. All right. Uh, I mean, there are lots of publications about uh, the slaves' garden, the, the, the gardens that they kept near their cabins. Um, there are, um, I mean, I, in the French context, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say that there are a lot of publications about, about the environment, but there are a few publications about yeah the slave gardens and how um it was used to fuel the slaves economy and like to feed the enslaved when uh um they were not fed by their masters or to complement their feed ratios but um yeah i don't um... okay any other one want any others want to comment as an environmental turn and slavery studies uh, sure, that john's book might help initiate i can just jump in really quickly as melanie was saying i mean the works that i've engaged with uh, particularly those to do with sort of hurricanes received from Spit Shorts and Machu um, mm. and on a yellow fever, and so on from J.R.R. McNeil. I feel as though that's a good kind of trend in terms of, I mean, I, I can't necessarily say there's a very specific focus on enslaved persons in particular, um, but we do get a sense in ways, ways in which you're kind of impacting slave societies that I think is a good foundation that certainly needs to be built upon even further and take it even closer and uh, especially in, as we're going to the kind of voice of the enslaved persons and so on so that's my quick kind of thoughts exactly on. yeah those are really important references yeah. uh, so not much to add but um i have been reading um some works uh both on uh, so one on sort of enslaved people and um sort of the gathering of um of herbs and medicines and so on that actually then get sort of trans transported and used in in uh, in Britain, and I suppose not. This is not really specifically the Caribbean, but um, I think one of the areas that's really exciting is um, sort of uh, animal, like the study of animal studies or animal studies mm -hmm. in and its relationship to enslaved uh, people, which I think John, um, in your work, you sort of um, and you, in this presentation that you 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 touched on. Right. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, perhaps, I, I know that people have been here for quite a while. It's been, been absolutely fascinating, but it has some, some, a, an awful lot of questions. It shows the interest that's, uh, that's interested, that, that, that your book is, in, is, 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 uh, uh, is get, getting, getting from, from a large number of people. But perhaps we could just finish, John, by asking uh, 
uh, some, poor persons, some questions about what motivated you. We have a question from Martha Van Bakel asking, how did you become aware of these sources and their potential in telling these narratives of resistance? And I perhaps we could, we could follow that up as, why did you write this book? What do you hope you will achieve by it? What difference do you think your book makes uh, to uh, slavery studies in, 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 in general? Uh, so why did you write it? Where did you get the sources from? What do you hope the effects might be? Okay, yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I, uh, I, I wrote this book uh, and I wrote it the way I did because I really wanted to open to a wider audience the stories that I found. Um, and I wanted uh, a book that would be accessible, not only to you know the hundred or so professors who read my earlier books, but, but my students, my undergraduate students in particular at UT Arlington, um, hopefully your students out there, uh, general readers. I mean, these are incredible stories in that they re reveal uh they reveal a side of the haitian revolution that has not been visible and i was lucky enough to kind of stumble on this out of just my conviction that the story of Mackendall, the poisoner did not make sense that it didn't make sense to celebrate uh the heroism of a man who supposedly was responsible for the the poisoning deaths of thousands and thousands of other enslaved people. So I really wanted to understand what Mackendall was coming from and what this poison was. And that sort of, that was the thread that I began to pull and pull and pull. Um, but I, you know, I think Melissa is right when she says this is a political act. I mean, these are, these are stories that I, you know, that r writing this book in the last five years uh, in the United States um, and encountering these stories and sort of you know being inspired by the accessibility of text by Laurent and others really made me want to you know, make this a kind of book that you know that that my you know that my my family could read that my friends could read who aren't academics because I think it's really important I think the Haitian Revolution is something that is increasingly you know taught in high schools and colleges when I was you know, when I was in high school and, and in college, the Haitian Revolution was still this terrible disaster that befell a, a flourishing colony. Um, and now we understand the Atlantic conversation. And I, I hope this book is evidence of the Atlantic conversation that Laurent talked about in, in, in Avengers, that Medor and others are thinking politically, they're thinking in a long-term uh, fashion, and they're not thinking about violence. The violence, the, barbar the barbarian, uh, narrative of the Haitian Revolution is one created by French colonists and perpetuated really by their actions. And so I really wanted to present enslaved people uh, in a different light, which by the way is why I'm you know, using the beautiful picture of the Haitian waterfall in the southeast part of the country you know, as in my slide presentation. I want to sort of provide a different view of, the, of, of, of Haiti and of the revolution, one that celebrates it uh, and celebrates it in a way that's consistent with the archival record but maybe changes the way we tell those archival stories. Thank you, thank you very much, John. That's a very eloquent, eloquent answer. Uh, and I'd like to say that this has been a, a, a fantastic uh, webinar. We've had a large number of people joining us. Uh, and one of the things that I, says, I think says something about the quality of the panel's presentations and the quality of the book that you've presented, John, uh, is that the great majority of those people are still with us uh, and listening. So thank you very much to the audience. Uh, for, for, for staying with us uh, and, and I think have, have learned a great deal. Um, thank you very much, Laurent, Dexnell, Melanie, Melissa uh, and, and, and Dominique for some really penetrating questions, which I know, mm -hmm. I know that John will be in touch with you individually uh, mm -hmm. in order to, to answer some of those things. Um, just to remind you that A Secret Among the Blacks uh, is uh, coming to all good bookshops uh, or at least all places where you can buy books. Uh, very soon. It should be released in September, I think that's right, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that one of the things is that this panel today has shown, uh, I think, a glimpse of the richness of this particular book. One of the things which is so impressive about it uh, is it combines a dense local study uh, of a fascinating region uh, with a good deal of violence and brutality. It's not for the faint-hearted, 
many of the stories that, that are contained with it. it. It brings enslaved people very much to the fore in ways that I've seldom seen uh, in any works of, 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 uh, of of with any works of history in, in, on, on the Caribbean. It, as Dominique has pointed out, goes back all the way to the 1720s uh, and uh, gives us a great way in whereby, whereby we can look uh, at the Haitian Revolution, the sort of things that Melissa and Dexman were talking about with the wider implications of the Haitian Revolution later on. It's both a local study and also one which restores the origins of the Haitian Revolution uh, to its proper place in history. It's a major intervention uh, and I know we'll get a lot of attention. Uh, and you can see by the quality uh, of the interventions today from our distinguished panel, uh, just how much this book has intrigued, uh, intrigued them uh, and will intrigue readers. So thank you very much, John, in particular, uh, for, 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 for writing this book. Uh, thank you very much for the attendees for, for joining us. Uh, we wish you all the best for the summer. We hope that you'll be able to join us next year for whatever the next webinar will be.